Welcome to Rethink, a podcast by Think with Google. I'm Rachel Corbett, and after spending most of my career hosting radio, presenting TV shows, and running a podcast network, the people dealing with the commercial side of commercial media, you know, the ones that were always making sure that the bills got paid on time, always intrigued me over there in their nice shoes. So when Google said, look, Rachel, we would like you to find the most savvy makers, marketers, and media creatives out there and get them to tell you all of their secrets about how they're navigating this, wait for it, I'm going to say it, new normal. Haven't we heard that a lot? So naturally, I said yes. But rather than just chew their ear off with all of my questions, I wanted to focus on the sort of rethinking that you need to hear, because otherwise it'd just be a podcast for one person and nobody wants that. So for the last month, I have been busily collecting your problems, conundrums and sticky situations. And today's challenge, left on my snazzy Mission Impossible style voicemail, is one that's probably popped up for many of you over the past few months. Hey, Rach. Um, So, as you know, we've had three months of living simpler lives and we've been baking, playing board games and doing our DIY. But I want to know, what are the behaviours we'll keep as we go forward from this post-COVID experience and how can brands adapt? Good question. I also want to know if I'm allowed to wear PJs to work all the time because I have gotten quite used to that. What are the behaviours that are actually going to stick around as we move forward into whatever post-COVID looks like and how can brands adapt? It's a pretty relevant question to get the ball rolling because like you, I also have been working from my home office slash kitchen and also occasionally when I'm on the Google Hangout, pressing mute and baking something in the oven. Thanks, have a good that. But look, I know you didn't come to this podcast for my icing recipes. You can hit me up later for those. We kick things off with someone who definitely has their finger on the pulse and the play button of our watching habits. I'm very fortunate to actually be the guy that gets to watch YouTube videos for a living. (laughs) Ash Chang is the head of culture and trends for the Asia Pacific region at YouTube. What a snazzy job. Which means he basically spends all of his time scrolling and tracking trending topics and watching YouTube. He's noticed that during the first half of 2020, while people have been lonely and on their own and in their PJs, not seeing anybody that people have been searching for, connection. During this period, what people found was that content could serve other purposes. We would typically think of content consumption as a way to be entertained, but I think for a lot of people during isolation, we actually used content as a form of utility. Mm. How can we use connected video to learn new things about ourselves and the world around us? It's easy to think of external connection, but I think of other components of connection as well. And that's how are people connecting to themselves? How are they connecting to each other? And how are they connecting to the things that they're passionate about? And the great thing about YouTube and about digital content and about video in general is that they're all conduits for all of those types of connections to happen. And connect we did. When we found ourselves stuck inside the four walls of our home for the first time in, well, ever, platforms like YouTube became a way to invite people over without breaking any social distancing laws, which was great. And one of the hashtags that was accelerating, and I mean foot to the floor acceleration, was with me. Now, if you don't know what with me is, it's basically videos of everyday people doing everyday things like cooking, exercising and cleaning. And even though it ramped up during COVID, people have been digging this content on YouTube for a while. The kind of first instance that we recognise with me was around 2010 and was based around Get Ready With Me videos, which was beauty vloggers predominantly inviting their audience to basically mirror what they were doing. So applying makeup at the same time. The idea being that through their content, they're turning seemingly banal, solitary tasks into communal experiences. That spread to other things that people are interested in or care about. One example that we always love to cite is study with me. So videos of people literally studying in real time. That blows my mind. That really, to me, shows how much people are craving connection. If it's like, I will have somebody saying nothing to me, sitting there, reading their textbook, just to have someone here with me while I'm doing it. Yes. And this type of content, specifically study with me videos, has millions and millions and millions of views. And I think the beautiful thing about YouTube is that no one would ever commission that as content. But... What With Me content provides is 
so much more than that. It's legitimate motivation. And I think the views of this type of content is a testament to that. And again, it, it comes back to the hidden utility of video to me, that our desire to mirror the behavior of others, our desire for social connectedness, all of that can make something as seemingly crazy as watching someone study actually have a real impact in your real world behavior. Some of the biggest non-music live streams that happened on the platform this year were from people doing live exercises that audiences all over the globe could follow along with at home. Mm. We actually found that in Australia, over 7 million Aussies watch YouTube on their TV screens. And the watch time for YouTube viewed on TV screens grew over 65% year on year in Australia in March of this year. And, you know, I think it does link back to the content that was popular during this time. So if you're doing a home exercise, for example, you're going to play that on your TV. You're not going to watch that on your phone. So I think people, in terms of the way that we watched YouTube, again, the, the circumstances of the times really made it perfect for people to embrace the platform in a new way. So people are shifting their behaviour from the small screen to the big screen. And the big screen is obviously something we're very comfy with sitting in front of it with our snacks. But the way we're interacting with this kind of content, like with me, is different. The key distinction to me is that we typically think of consumption as absent-minded and passive. It's like content is something that is happening to us. The difference with with me content is that it's highly intentional. You're watching it for a reason. And the purpose of that content is to induce an action in the real world, which is very different to how we typically think of consumption. Okay, so quick recap. If you want to create content that really taps into people's need for connection, there's got to be a two-way relationship between the person on the screen and their audience. Viewers want to be engaged, but they also want to be involved in what they're watching. So if you're thinking, yes, I want to create branded content that builds connection, Ash has some advice on the best way to do it. Whenever I talk about marketing or branded content in general, I always like to say less messages, more stories. Find the authentic voice and the authentic space in which your brand can operate. It's a transactional thing that happens. Audiences are giving up their time and attention and they better get something back. And that something better be more than a brand message. Very rarely are brand videos useful, but almost always useful videos will be good brand videos. So my advice to any brand is don't try to make brand videos, try to make useful videos. Find out the way that you can legitimately turn up for your audience and provide utility to them. Mm. So if you're a bank, it could be financial literacy. If you're a food delivery service, it could be home cooking. But whatever it is, that piece of content needs to deliver some form of utility to the audience or there's actually no reason for it to exist. And let's face it, ain't nobody out there wanting to dish up content that shouldn't exist. So how do you nail the creative? What is the secret sauce that you need to add to make sure that your branded video content is as watchable as the stuff people have actually come to YouTube to watch? So the first thing for me in terms of the secret sauce, if we call it that, it's got to be emotion. Ah, yes, emotion. The first of the secret herbs and spices in our secret sauce. To find out more about creative that gets people hooked, I'm chatting with Simon Joyce, founder of Emotive, an integrated creative agency that's had a lot of success in branded video content. They've got some impressive watch times. We're talking two minutes plus here. And the way they've done it is by focusing on narrative tension and making sure that people feel it as quickly as possible. So the faster we can land a dramatic narrative tension, the more likely we're going to get the audience to hang around. A narrative tension will trump talent, it'll trump cinematography, it'll trump music. So a dramatic narrative tension can absolutely unlock a bit of view time. And if you can get it to the point where the overall story is delivering emotion to the point where there's a physiological reaction, that tends to be our best performing ads or content. It unquestionably drives better view through times, it drives better engagement rates, it lifts brand sentiment, and it usually always delivers better 
commercially, depending on what the objectives of the campaign were. There's been a lot of upheaval for businesses, but also just for people, their routines, their schedules, everything's kind of out of whack. How do you think that's kind of changed the way that brands need to tell stories if they want to connect to these people who are having a very different experience of life than they were a year ago? There's two parts to that. One thing I would really clearly want to point out is the same principles apply. Like it's not that dramatic, the shift here. There's a clear problem to be solved. We need to find great strategic territories that set us up for creative success. And that process is absolutely unchanged. I think if there's a key difference, if I was to try and pinpoint one thing, it's just being more consumer-centric than we've ever been. Our job at Emotive is to try and build emotional connections on behalf of brands with their target audience. We must understand now more than ever how they're feeling. It's a different world right now. We all know that. So can we spend more time tapping into where they're at, the cultural forces that are at play and what that means in terms of how we communicate? So we know emotion is the key ingredient in our delicious secret sauce, but we're not just talking about making people go, eh, that's interesting. If you really want to stop eyeballs from going anywhere else, you got to work way harder than that. And you also got to do a little taste testing. So I'm talking instead of just being ha-ha funny, I laugh out loud. I'm talking about being somewhat moved to the hairs on the back of my neck stand up, being mildly surprised to gasping with astonishment. And we know when we get content or ads to that point because we do facial coding and we test this. Every time we land in that area where we're getting those intense emotional reactions, the emotional intensity through the edit is there in film especially. Basically, you want to get people right in the feels. And you know who's good at getting intense emotional reactions out of people? Creators on platforms like YouTube who are doing it with their content every day like it's no big deal. So how do you do that in a way that means some real big results? When you approach a creator, first you've got to go in humbly. You got to, These guys... They know the, their audience better than you ever will. And you need to go in for, on behalf of a brand going, hey, despite the involvement of a brand, we believe that this idea can actually be more effective than some of your day-to-day content. We're running a series at the moment for HelloFresh. It's a brand content campaign. This one's running in New Zealand and it's called How to Dinner by a talent over there, How to Dad. So meal kit category in New Zealand, it's pretty cluttered. A lot of players there. My food bag has been the number one player over there, and the category has quite a stuffy perception around it. Enter HelloFresh, and our strategy, our brand platform there, is simply delicious. We need to elevate that in our communications. Cooking show is going to be the way into content. What's the talent we're going to align with? Well, How To Dad, this guy's renowned for just amazing hacks. He's hilarious. His brand tone is smack on for where HelloFresh wants to play, and that immediately gives them a little bit of edge against the more sort of chefy competitors. They're not taking themselves as seriously. How can we enter his world authentically? Now we're going to the alignment. He goes, yeah, I can see something working here. Then we start presenting scripts. Here's how we're thinking an episode could work. Now, each creator is going to want to work at different levels through that collaboration with our writers. But the best creators will be really detailed through that process. I guess the proof's in the pudding on that one. That one's averaging four minutes plus so far. It's getting fabulous organic views. We're backing it up with shorter form creative 30s and 15s, which will retarget on the back of it. And all the brand metrics are turning as are the media metrics. So that's been a good result. Four minutes watch time is a great result, but you're never going to get that if there's not something in your content for everybody. So how do you make sure both a brand and an audience are getting something out of it? Getting the synchronicity between brand, audience and content is the challenge. And if you don't have it, if you're creating something that is secondary to what they do day in, day out, just don't do it. Like just stay, stay right away from it. There's always going to be that creative tension if you're working with creators especially around some of the nuances of how you execute but what there shouldn't be any tension around is the central idea and what it does for their audience and equally what it does for the brief on behalf of the brand that should be crystal crystal clear and if it isn't you're going to end up with a second class output and nobody wants that what you want to do is create the kind of branded content that makes people hit subscribe in terms of setting up enduring partnerships And this whole idea that as a brand, you could have people subscribing to your content. You can have people actually anticipating what you're going to do next, which is counterintuitive to how any advertising happens. No one's sitting there looking forward to the next ad. Like 
Uh, it's interrupting our entertainment. So when we do enter that world, the other thing I just want me to pains is say there's a role for for that world and there's a role for these sort of content plays as well. But yeah, when you get that right, the payoff can be significant. So our secret sauce is simmering. We've thrown in a packet of emotion, a few cups of dramatic tension. We've nailed the balance of messaging and utility. I'm standing here in an apron. So why is digital the perfect place to serve this baby up? You don't get a better chance to have two-way interaction on behalf of a brand than through digital. You can't get that anywhere else. You've got an incredible targeting opportunity to know you are speaking, in most cases, to the right audience. You've got creative flex that you don't have in other channels. So the opportunity to use different ways of creating greater creative impact and really understanding how you're showing up in the consumer's world with these sort of platforms that are ever-changing. All this talk of secret sources and stirring and mixing feels like the perfect time to bring in Marion Grasby. Who's Marion Grasby? Where have you been? Hey guys, I'm Marion. All right guys, just look at that crunch, listen to the sound. Crispy pork belly, like the holy grail of roasted meats. I have figured out a way that we can get our crispy roast pork. Marion's a former MasterChef contestant, a cookbook author, and she has over 800,000 subscribers watching her cook up a storm on her YouTube channel. So how does she feel about the platform she's created? For me, YouTube is the way that I connect with a whole community of food-loving people. I make cooking videos and hopefully bring people a little bit of joy through the food that we cook and the conversations we have. Marion's also a very savvy marketer who's built a loyal following of dumpling and pork belly obsessed fans on her channel. So how did she do it? Well, I've got to be a little honest here. Um, When we first started it, we didn't really put very much effort into it. And then about two years ago, I became an avid YouTube watcher. I mean, it's pretty much all I watch now. And I want to create my own community and have my own conversations. And so I really put a lot of effort into trying to build that and build that on my own channel. You've been on both telly and on YouTube. What do you reckon is the difference between the two platforms? YouTube and TV, they're completely different things. It's like trying to describe golf and hockey as the same sport just because there's a stick involved. (laughs) Yes, you use a camera to film TV episode. Yes, you use cameras to film YouTube episodes. But YouTube is about being with people. It's not showing someone something passively. It's actually an active experience. With YouTube, people want to see the real you and they want to connect with the real you. So it's about really like trying to make that connection through the camera, trying to talk to people as if they are your friends and really having a good conversation because YouTube is one of those things where it is all about the to and fro. It's not a passive video that people just are sitting back and watching. I think the best YouTubers are the ones that really sort of connect with their audience and they know what their audience wants. And that's what's so special about it. And that's what makes YouTube so unique. Marion mostly promotes her own range of Marion's Kitchen products on her channel, but she knows what her audience wants and also what they don't want when it comes to branded content. If it comes across like an ad with brand, 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 product, product, product in your face, you might think as a brand, oh, but that's better because people are seeing the brand or the logo or whatever. But as a YouTube consumer and as a creator, it's far more powerful if you can integrate the brand or the product into the story or the episode or the video in a way that's far more natural. And even if it's more subtle, it would have more of an impact if you actually have that creator talking and using your brand in a very natural way. So when you boil it down, I'm really getting into this cooking metaphor, creating effective content is just about putting your audience first. For me, every single piece of content or every single recipe that I'm thinking up all comes back to what is it that my community wants to watch. You really want to be giving the audience what they want and you don't have to guess what they want because you can deep dive, and this is what we do constantly on my channel, deep dive right into the analytics and I can actually see what people want to watch within a video. I can see when they're turning off. I can see when they're jumping back to repeat something. I can see when they're interested in something and when they're not. You would think that the most 
interesting part of the video would be like the sexy sizzling or the steak going on the barbecue or something like that. But you you know what people want to watch? They want to watch me mixing stir fry sauces. This was a really big revelation for me. They're not just watching the mixing of the stir fry sauce, obviously that's being a bit facetious, but they want information. So when I'm mixing a stir fry sauce, I'm talking about the different soy sauces that I'm using or the oyster sauce or why I'm using these particular ingredients. And That's information and analytics will tell you some of this, but they will tell you also directly. Neon Style 306 is going to say, I want to see more pasta recipes. I want to see more noodle recipes. And they're the things that you should be paying attention to. And I know that people come to me for information, number one. They come to me for techniques, number two, and they come to have a bit of a laugh. And I know that from my audience analytics. I know that from the comments, all those things. And so every single thing that I do and every piece of content is all about that. And that's who I have in the back of my mind always. You've always got to be doing it for the audience. What Marion's saying is it's a two-way street. Your audience should feel like they can see you and hear you, but most importantly, interact with you. People aren't passively watching the creators they love. They're spending time with them. For me, YouTube has always been about with me. People watch YouTube for that company. Someone cooking a recipe of mine has me in their kitchen on their phone or on their laptop and we're literally cooking together. And say you're like making my first soup dumplings, that's a recipe that could take all day. So I'm literally spending all day with someone in their kitchen and that's kind of like the magic of YouTube. You're actually with me all the time. So there you have it. I think it's safe to say that one of the things we'll probably keep in the coming months is this idea of the newfound connection we have with our lovely video friends. Whether it's learning how to fold dumplings or doing some squats with your favourite trainer in your lounge room, the with me trend, which isn't a new thing, it's been around for a decade, doesn't show any signs of slowing down. It's only gaining momentum. So we're still going to consume this stuff and it's up to brands to keep finding the most creative and engaging ways to show up and reach consumers through online video. Really leaning into trends like With Me is one way to do it, but it's also about effective storytelling. Bottom line, people are there, but they want more than just to be shouted at. They're looking for engagement, connection, and above all, content that's useful and adds something to their lives. So what are you waiting for? Start thinking about how you can create video content that gives people all of the feels. And while you do that, I'm going off to look into how to start my own podcast with me channel. Oh, and take off this apron. Why don't I put this on? You've been listening to Rethink, a podcast by Think with Google. I have been your host, Rachel Corbett. If you've enjoyed the show, hit subscribe so you make sure you get the next one and share it with your friends. And if you're feeling like you want to give a bit of feedback and it's positive five-star minimum, make sure you leave a review because it helps people turning up to the show realise it's a good one. This podcast was brought to you by Think with Google, created by The Hallway and Eardrum in partnership with Google and produced by Eardrum. The executive producer was Ralph Van Dyke and the producer was Sarah Mashman. Project manager is Jesse Williams. The theme was Rethought by Tucker Perry and the engineer was Adrian Walton. This podcast was recorded on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation.